Good morning, everyone. Um, before we begin, could I just remind you to turn off your cell phone and any other electronic devices that won't interfere with the uh, recording. Thank you. Well, I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Public Affairs Programs, and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I want to thank you all for beginning your day with us. We are delighted to welcome Bill Drosiak to this Public Affairs Program. He will be discussing his book, Fractured Continent, Europe's Crisis, and the Fate of the West, which, by the way, was selected by the Financial Times as one of the best political books of 2017, and it will be available for you to uh, purchase at the end of the program today. In reading Fractured Continent, it is not surprising that this timely and widely acclaimed book was chosen by the FT for such an honor. Nor that our friend Enzo Viscusi had the foresight to suggest that we host Bill to talk about his findings. As such, I'd like to give a special thanks to our mutual friend Enzo for his impeccable judgment. We all have dreams, aspirations, and hopes for a better future. Following the devastation of two world wars and the collapse of the Berlin Wall, European leaders were no exception. Their dream was to create a zone of perpetual peace and prosperity, one that would lead to constructing a harmonious community of states. However, for some time now, pundits have been noting that after years of post-war consensus and extraordinary achievements, this utopian vision of a united Europe appears to be unraveling. It is clear that voters in Europe, as well as the United States, are abandoning traditional ways of governing in favor of authoritarian, populist, and nationalist alternatives, which are all raising profound threats to the future of our democracies. The question is, how did the unified, peaceful Europe of the late 20th century turn into the fractured, discordant continent of the early 21st? In Fractured Continent, our speaker, who's had decades of experience living and working in Europe, not only as a respected journalist, but also as a leader of important transatlantic think tanks, writes about how and why this European experiment is now imploding. He is also tells us what this means for the United States and why the Atlantic Alliance one of the most crucial foundations of global security is in danger. It's not just his easy access to leaders in key European capitals, but his acute observations, analysis, and perspicacity that makes reading Fractured Continent so compelling. It is a tumultuous time in contemporary European history. For a better understanding of why the European dream is becoming such a nightmare, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our guest today, Bill Rosiak. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Joy. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming out here today. And Joanne, thank you for your kind words of introduction. Um, it's I've been uh, running around for the last two months uh, doing book promotion tours both here and in Europe. Uh, and in many respects, been a fascinating way to uh, take the pulse in areas that I don't often get to, such as uh, the Midwest. And um, recently, I just had a dinner, I'll just start with this anecdote, with uh, John Kasich, the Republican governor. And he was interested in finding out what was going on in Europe. And he sa I said, well, what's the biggest challenge for you? And he just said, you know, I just received a report saying that by the year 2030, truck driving will be obsolete. And he said, you know, there are 5 million people in Ohio who earn their livelihoods from truck driving. He says, so what do I or my successors do when, you know, at a time when we have greater polarization? If you think it's bad now, what's going to be like then? And I thought this was a very telling comment because it's also happening in Europe and elsewhere in Western democracies, that the challenges of populism are related to globalization, or a backlash against that, and also the rise of these technologies that we were having a lot of uh, uh, difficulty in coping with. Well, the genesis of my book, I suppose, uh, began was uh, traced back to uh, November of 1989. At that time, I was the foreign editor for the Washington Post, and I was on a traveling tour visiting our bureaus in Southeast Asia. And I happened to be in Bangkok, getting ready to leave early in the morning with our correspondent, Keith Richburg to visit uh, the Khmer Rouge on the Cambodian border. I get a phone call uh, 
3 a.m. and I groggily pick up the receiver and it's, it's my boss, Ben Bradley, in his raspy voice as he inevitably says, Dross, they're tearing down the wall. Get your ass to Berlin. I go, but, but, but. <clears throat> he said, no buts, get there. So I managed to get the next flight uh, to Frankfurt and then on to Berlin. And it was there, it was just a remarkable human scene as people crossed from East Berlin into the West for the first time. And so I thought, uh, how could I contribute? I'll write a feature. And I knew exactly where all of these Easterners were going to go. It was the sixth floor of the KDV Shopping Emporium, which happens to be the, the grand, it still is, very grand uh, place for gourmet foods because uh, in East Germany, for them, it was a big event when they'd get a shipment of bananas from Cuba. And there I found them just hordes of East Germans just gawking at all these, these foodstuffs. And um, in fact, the lead of my uh, story in the next day's paper wrote itself. It was a group of East Germans standing in front of a pyramid of oranges from South Africa in November, remember. And uh, they were just in tears. And then they started, and they were uh, bursting out saying the, the lies, the lies, die Lugen, and uh, that they had been told that this was a Potemkin village in the West. And I realized that day that it was going to, they would stop at nothing less than uh, equality of living standards. And sure enough, within three weeks, <clears throat> Helmut Kohl, uh, the chancellor, stepped forward with a 10-point plan for German unification. All of the uh, second thoughts <clears throat> of other leaders like Margaret Thatcher and Francois Mitterrand were swept away because uh, Kohl enjoyed the support of George H.W. Bush <clears throat> in moving toward a unification of Europe, a Europe whole and free. And sure enough, within a year, it had also swept away the Soviet Union, as we saw, and, uh, and Gorbachev in the process. So it was at that time that, uh, in order to mollify the concerns of other Europeans, that Kohl and Francois Mitterrand decided we need to anchor Germany in the heart of Europe, uh, of the European Union, with three grand initiatives, the one being to create a single currency, the euro, and so they laid out a timetable within 10 years. Germany would give up its cherished Deutschmark and other countries as well in pursuit of a single currency. There would be a, the creation of a borderless Europe so that people could travel on vacations across borders and see, sense the freedom of having this, this open, open Europe. And that was codified in the Schengen Treaty a couple years later. And then there was the decision to embrace the new democracies in Central and Eastern Europe uh, by expanding the institutions of NATO and the European Union to the east, right up to the border of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of Russia. <clears throat> and at the time, I remember interviewing um, Helmut Kohl, and I said, well, aren't you basically biting off more than you can chew? And of course, Cole, a man of immense appetites, uh, said, no, we're going to broaden Europe and we're going to deepen it at the same time. So basically, he said, we're going to expand it. And now it's 28 nations. Uh, but we're also going to deepen it in pursuit of uh, the dream of the United States and Europe. So over the years, um, the, uh, this project seemed to go off the rails. And I, I became particularly concerned as somebody who's followed Europe for much of my professional career, um, that uh, it was facing an existential crisis by 2015. Europe never has recovered yet from the 2008 financial crisis, and then we suddenly had a refugee crisis on top of an um, international crisis when Russia uh, went into the Ukraine, uh, took over Crimea, uh, and is still <clears throat> involved in uh, operations in eastern Ukraine. So we saw that uh, all of these challenges were coming to a head. So I, I decided that the best way to report a book of this sort was to be to travel as widely as possible over the course of a couple years. <clears throat> and I developed a narrative approach that 
Uh, the, the book is structured 12 chapters, 12 capitals, each in its own way illustrates a different dimension of uh, the crises facing Europe. Um, and this is sort of a panoramic approach, but during the course of the reporting, there were several themes that, that came out in a, in a very vivid way. And while Europe has recovered somewhat, that there is a <clears throat> sense of, I think, premature optimism now that there is a little bit of growth coming in and the election of Emmanuel Macron has given a new sense of, uh, of optimism that, uh, that Europe can move ahead, there are still <clears throat> great divisions uh, across Europe. In fact, I would argue that in some ways uh, the, the political landscape is more fragmented uh, than any time in the last three decades. Uh, you have a north-south split uh, that the, the wealthy creditor countries in the north, such as Germany, <clears throat> And uh, Scandinavian countries are reluctant to put too much of their money at risk in order to uh, uh, subsidize the poorer countries in the South who are heavily indebted, who feel that in order to put more of their people to work, particularly the younger generation that, that feels bereft and lost uh, <clears throat> in this world of globalization, um, that it would... Uh, that this, this conflict has still not been resolved. Now we have also an east-west divide as we see Poland and Hungary uh, revert to more nationalistic approaches, um, claiming that uh, they, they are being dictated to by a <clears throat> faceless bureaucracy in Brussels. And this is developing into a serious challenge, particularly with Warsaw. War, uh, Poland gets <clears throat> two, more than $2 billion a month in subsidies from the European Union. But rather than showing their gratitude, they seem to be uh, thumbing their nose at Brussels and saying, we want to re recover more of our national power and our sovereignty. And at the same time, <clears throat> the Polish government is cracking down on the press, <clears throat> on an independent judiciary, and taking, uh, taking back some of the democratic values that, are, that were part of the contract of joining the European Union. So this is going to be a continuing conflict because uh, in bringing these countries into the European Union, it was never thought that they would ever um, renege on their democratic uh, conditions. Um, and so how this gets resolved <coughs> is still open to question. And most recently, as we see, there are uh, pressures of regional separate, separatism. Uh, October 1st, uh, Catalonia announced that it wanted to become an independent state. <clears throat> the, uh, the central government of uh, Madrid is trying to uh, prevent this, <clears throat> saying it would violate the Constitution. And uh, we'll see what happens on December 21st. <clears throat> with the election there that will determine where, where Spain goes and whether it can stay uh, united. And at the same time, this has infected other countries, such as Italy and Belgium, that have regions interested in breaking apart. Recently, there were referendums in, uh, the, in Lombardy, <clears throat> where Milan is located, and also in the region of Venice, uh, where uh, people voted by 90% to say we want more power um, <clears throat> returned to us because we're tired of subsidizing <clears throat> the poor areas of the South. So I suppose uh, how Europe will deal with these um, different conflicting pressures is going to be a, a uh, crucial factor in, in determining whether the European Union can move ahead and continue to thrive because I think it's been one of the great achievements <clears throat> in post-war history that Europe can lay to rest these conflicts, particularly between France and Germany, and develop peaceful and prosperous relations among all of their neighbors. Um, and this has profound impact on the United States <clears throat> because we've been very much um, involved in uh, 
the, uh, the European project. It has been uh, something that has been key to our own peace and prosperity. And this brings me to um, the, <clears throat> the latest challenge affecting Europe and also the United States, and that is the approach <clears throat> of the Trump administration toward what's going on in Europe. Uh, since 1945, we've had 12 American presidents, six Republicans, six Democrats, each uh, have made the Atlantic Alliance the foundation of American foreign policy. <clears throat> now we have a president who says Europe is not a strategic ally, but a, a commercial rival of the United States. And the Trump administration seems to put the emphasis on Europe as a, a threat you know, in the economic sense to the United States and a burden in terms of our security guarantees. And when I've been traveling around Europe recently, the reaction has been so swift and stunning that it makes me wonder whether this alliance will be able to survive much uh, many more years into the future because in Europe there's an attitude now that if America has elected a president who is saying these things, <clears throat> the, we think the credibility of America is shattered. And I've heard this from people like <clears throat> Germany's former Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer, <clears throat> uh, Sweden's former Prime Minister Carl Bildt, <clears throat> and sorry, many other prominent Europeans who, uh, who say we need to start acting on our own. And Chancellor Merkel uh, herself has reluctantly reached this conclusion. I've, I interviewed her several times in the context of, of this book. And in May, she said, uh, after, um, after con her last meeting with uh, Donald Trump, and since then, they haven't had any contact whatsoever. It was so disastrous that she said, perhaps the time has come for Europe to take <clears throat> its destiny in its own hands. And in a way, it's understandable because for 70 years, uh, for a continent as wealthy as Europe to outsource its security guarantees to a country like the United States, it's never been, uh, never occurred before in history. So it is an anomaly. And uh, perhaps it is time that this is wound down in such a way um, that we find a peaceful resolution uh, that as America retreats inward, uh, Europe finds a way to develop its own uh, security guarantees. <clears throat> That's going to be difficult because uh, uh, you're in Germany, the key central country, there's a great reluctance to invest in the defense sector. They feel uh, in many respects that the pacifist sentiment has become ingrained in the culture. <clears throat> And they think that they already do enough in terms of economic reconstruction and aid to uh, the rest of the world. So uh, I think in terms of the new optimism that one has heard, largely generated by the election of Emmanuel Macron, uh, the big challenge is going to be whether Germany will live up to Macron's hopes that they can join together France and Germany as the new axis to push Europe forward, and this is going to require a heavy investment by Germany <clears throat> in security, developing security and, and, and defense guarantees for the continent in the face of <clears throat> a retreating the United, the United States. And how this is resolved is really open to uh, a lot of challenges and questions uh, at a time when Populism is still um, on the rise, um, and I don't see this going away, uh, despite the defeat of <clears throat> Marine Le Pen in France and populist forces in <clears throat> the Netherlands. They're still very strong. If anything, um, a populist party will be part of the new government in Austria, and we see its forces um, uh, rising elsewhere in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and I suppose this has been perhaps the <coughs> strongest impression I, I gained 
during the two years of my travels was the sudden and remarkable um, uh, decline in public confidence in the mainstream governing parties across all of Europe. And you see this, start, you can look at Britain, where there is a great erosion of support for the conservative leadership and a great distrust toward the Labour Party led by a, an unreconstructed Stalinist, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. You, uh, you see it in France where Macron took advantage of the <clears throat> vacuum in power by uh, uh, leaving his, uh, his own Socialist Party, <clears throat> which is now in ruins, and, um, and defeating the, the candidates from the uh, conservative wing, which is also <laughs> trying to rebuild itself. And uh, the latest uh, election in Germany showed <clears throat> both Merkel's Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats lost so, something like 14% of the vote. So people are, are moving away from the governing parties because they feel neglected and, uh, and also uh, distrustful toward <clears throat> the centrist parties, and they're looking for um, new departures, um, whether it be from extremist parties from the right or from the left, as we've seen with the rise of Podemos in Spain and <clears throat> Syriza in, in, in Greece. Um, and so the challenges facing Europe politically are intertwined with the economic crisis. Uh, and how this is finally resolved is, is really going to depend, I think, not just on Europe, but also American leadership. Because my old friend and mentor, Richard Holbrook, <clears throat> always contended that America was integral to the success of the European project, that we standing behind Europe uh, was going to be um, an important factor, uh, that America indeed was a European power and needed to remain so in order to help bind these, these other countries together in the challenges that they face. So I think that uh, 2018 is going to be a, a critical uh, year, indeed I think a sort of a hinge moment in history <clears throat> when a lot of these forces are going to come, come together and whether Europe will, will, will realize that it has to take its destiny in its own hands, as Angela Merkel says, or whether it, it starts to dissolve and we see the slow erosion of, of the European Union, which I think would be um, a disastrous development because, as I mentioned, it has been so successful in um, burying the ghosts of, of history, uh, the demons of nationalism, um, and, and, and building a peaceful and prosperous uh, order for, for Europe. If, if the EU is sent into reverse and deteriorates, I think it, uh, it could unleash <clears throat> a lot of the old um, um, power struggles that have led to conflict and wars uh, over, the, over the centuries. And, and this would be a disaster not just for Europe, but also for the rest of the world. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions and, uh, and hear some thoughts and comments from you as well. Thank you very much for that really the setting a wonderful foundation for what I know is going to be an interesting discussion. Um, when you um, are called upon, would you please introduce yourself and keep the question to start over here? Hi, Jim. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Jim, Jim Ho from Tenail uh, Holdings. <coughs> Bill, could you talk a little bit about the Russian-EU relationship? Putin seems to be on a sustained campaign to fragment Europe. He's got elections coming up. Things at home are not uh, all that favorable for him at the moment. It's a scenario for further foreign adventurism. What should we expect? Well, this is uh, <clears throat> one of the chief uh, uh, strategic challenges facing, facing Europe. When I spoke to uh, Chancellor Merkel, she told me that over the course of two years, <clears throat> she met or spoke with, uh, with Putin 70 on 70 occasions. And she speaks, of course, flawless Russian. And he served as the uh, Dresden uh, station chief for the KGB for five years. So he also speaks uh, pretty good German. And 
<coughs> during the last years of the Obama administration, President Obama basically decided to outsource the West's policy on Ukraine and Russia toward, toward Merkel. So she found herself as the chief interlocutor with, with Putin. And one thing she said was quite striking. She said, you know, I've tried to make Putin understand that picking a fight with the West is the last thing he needs to do. He sa she said, you know, the, one of the great achievements of Germany is to establish peaceful and prosperous relations with all nine of its neighbors. <clears throat> Yet he seems to think that he can only provide security for Russia by destabilizing all of his neighbors. And, and she told him, as he said, you know, I told, I said, if, if I were sitting in Moscow, I would think, you know, my biggest challenge is China encroaching from the east and Islamic radicalism coming up from the south. And I would try to reach out to the west and, and, and find some support. And so she was trying to encourage him in this way. Uh, but yet, but Putin rejected this analysis, and I think it's partly his his effort to shore up support for his autocracy and his, <clears throat> some would say, kleptocracy uh, by by uh, playing the nationalist card against uh, against the West. And how long this goes on, we'll see. He'll probably get reelected for another four years. But already people are talking in Moscow as well as in, in Germany and elsewhere, uh, what follows uh, Putin. And um, some uh, experts that I've spoken with say it could be much worse, that we could get uh, an even more belligerent, nationalistic leader who would come after him. So he has so swept aside the potential leaders, uh, such as Boris Nemtsov, who was assassinated right in the shadow of the Kremlin, <clears throat> who, was a, who was a very charismatic, democratic-minded person, would have been a terrific leader, I think, of Russia, and others who have been uh, either assassinated or sent into political exile. Uh, so there's no, uh, no clear succession line that follows uh, Putin. But I think he will continue to... Uh, to probe uh, the West, uh, I think there's there's still a, uh, there's a stalemate now in uh, Ukraine, but he's also he's engaging in these hybrid warfare techniques. Um, I saw firsthand what he's doing in Latvia, where the capital Riga is half the population is ethnic Russian. <laughs> so the way in which they play upon the information game and uh, uh, radio, television fake news is going to continue, and the meddling in elections, as we've seen in, in, um, in, in uh, France, Germany, and probably in Italy next year. So I'm afraid I'm not very hopeful, but I think that is one of the long challenges, long-term challenges of Europe, finding some kind of a modus vivendi with a more stable and democratic-minded Russia, but I don't see that on the horizon right now. Uh, Warren Hogue, International Peace Institute. Uh, Bill, I want to ask you about migration, um, which up until the past year was the biggest problem facing Europe. Uh, you have a divided, fractious Europe that you correctly describe right now. A lot of the reason why right-wing parties have done so well in places like Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, um, Austria, um, has been because of anti-immigrant sentiment. Those people are still beating down the doors, particularly in Italy and Greece. Uh, what is Europe going to do about them? Can Merkel come up with any way to convince the other Europeans that her approach, which was to accommodate them, is the right approach? Right. Uh, well, that's a very pertinent, uh, Warren, your question, because uh, <clears throat> Merkel has put forward a plan, and the European Union has adopted, which will be unveiled at uh, a summit, I think, next week. Yeah or in coming days uh, with African nations, um, that their idea is to, the way to stop the flow of immigration from, from Africa and North Africa and the Middle East uh, <clears throat> is to develop a Marshall Plan, uh, create better economic conditions in these countries so that they will not, the younger generation will not feel impelled to leave and, um, and then uh, struggle to find their way into Europe. Uh, it's, it's open to question whether this is going to work because uh, the World Bank recently concluded in a report, right now there are 65 million people 
on the move, many of them looking for ways to get into Europe. And as you rightly point out, it's coming, the, the stream is no longer out of Turkey into Greece, but it's more coming up from Libya into Italy, and also now from Morocco into, into Spain. And a lot of these people are from sub-Saharan Africa who are fleeing the effects of climate change, meaning spreading drought and also uh, uh, civil wars. Uh, and that is going to continue. The World Bank report uh, says that <clears throat> with, probably within 15 years, there'll be 250 million people who are leaving. And the favored destination will, is probably going to continue to be Europe. So it's a race against time for Europe to develop these, these policies to um, encourage uh, young Africans and young people in the Middle East to stay at home and develop their own countries. Uh, and unfortunately, this is, this is counteracted, uh, the best instruments are counteracted by political pressures at home. An example is <clears throat> after Tunisia uh, had their the, the Arab Spring Revolution, which has been one of the few countries that has been moderately successful in uh, transferring from an autocratic regime toward a democracy, uh, they appealed for help from the European Union. So the feeling was, okay, let's open up our markets and uh, encourage Tunisia to ship their oranges in, and tomatoes into the European Union. Well, this was blocked by Spain and Netherlands, uh, who grow tomatoes and their farm, powerful farmer lobbies said, no, we can't afford to do this, <clears throat> we'll lose our own markets. And so as a result, the political pressures have stymied this effort. I hope this does not happen uh, with the Africa initiative. So it's gonna take a lot of political courage for these leaders in Europe to stand up to their lobbies and allow, the, um, allow funding and, and trade to be expanded with these African countries and give them something to live for because because right now they're, the situation is so desperate in a lot of these countries that they're willing to risk their lives to flee and, and find their way to Europe. Uh, Ron Berenbaum, <clears throat> uh, you haven't uh, said anything uh, uh, about uh, Brexit, or at least talked about it at all. Uh, negotiations appear to be at something of an impasse over the Irish frontier situation. The British government is falling apart over this. Uh, and uh, so what do you think is going to happen? And uh, by your omission uh, in your general remarks, uh, is it possible you think it doesn't make that much difference in the vast scheme of things? Right. Well, in, uh, <clears throat> you're right. In continental Europe, um, people are saying the Brits are gone, and we've got to start thinking about our own, our own fa fate, how we, how we develop this. And so the negotiations for many continental Europeans are something of a sideshow. Even for the British people, there's not that much attention. They... they have looked at some of these studies saying that they're going to suffer greatly the economic consequences, <clears throat> but those uh, consequences haven't been felt yet. But I think these negotiations are extremely difficult. Uh, they, they were on the brink of a breakthrough the other day, um, but then they announced that that fell short. <clears throat> uh, Theresa May, is pro a government is propped up by these uh, Unionists in in um, Northern Ireland who were have blocked uh, the best possible compromise that came up recently, so I don't know how they find their way out of this because the Ireland issue is is one of the keys to to solving this. A lot of people say that uh, as time goes on, uh, there will be more buyer's remorse, and is there a way to have an election in Britain that would uh, call a second referendum so that they can unwind all of this? Because I think a lot of people would like to see Britain stay in, but that uh, the longer these negotiations go on, the more difficult it's going to be. Tony Blair has come back from the political dead to, uh, 
try and launch a, 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 a program to, to get a second referendum going, but uh, uh, unfortunately, Tony Blair these days, in the aftermath of his decision on the Iraq war, is one of the most despised man, men in British politics. <clears throat> So he won't be the person to lead. Uh, there's been talk David Miliband uh, might leave New York and go back to, uh, to uh, Britain. I think he would be a fine leader um, who believes in Europe. But uh, so far, there's no sign of a political leadership. And it comes back to what I said about the, uh, the bankruptcy of the political mid center in all of Europe, starting with Britain. Uh, that they haven't found uh, the, the kind of strong leadership that's necessary. So these uh, negotiations will continue, but it's going to be very hard to meet the March 2019 deadline um, unless there's some remarkable breakthrough. But there could be some miraculous um, turning of the mind where uh, there, some political development happens. Let's say Mer uh, May's government collapses. They have a new election and some kind of constellation of forces uh, that is relatively pro-European emerges in such a way that they have a second referendum. And I think if they did have a second ref referendum, <clears throat> there would probably be a, a small majority in favor of staying within the European Union. Because it was only 52-48 the last time around. And it was all because young people failed to turn out in the numbers that were expected, but that was because Cameron was so foolish as to schedule the referendum the week of the final exams for university students <laughs> and on the eve of the Glastonbury Music Festival. So they were either out, <clears throat> they were feverishly studying for their exams or out getting plastered to uh, enjoy the end of the school year. <clears throat> uh, Anthony Fairless, how would Europe handle Catalonia clearly deciding to leave. And then also, is there some point where Europe does countenance these separatist movements if they were within particular linguistic or cultural boundaries? I mean, what's the problem with four or five more countries in Europe if you've got 28? Right, yeah, no, it's a very good question. Uh, I think this is really part of, this backlash against globalization reflects a desire on the part of many people <clears throat> to be governed closer to their their daily lives. Um, and that's the appeal for a lot of people in Catalonia. I would say the main grievance they have is that uh, <clears throat> they are being uh, compelled to subsidize the rest of Spain. That's what they believe. <clears throat> and there's some justification for that. I mean, since the financial crisis, um, I was told that uh, about 12, they lose about 12 billion euros a year going out to Madrid, and they complain that they don't get much back in the way of uh, it reinvestment. So these grievances are continuing to build, particularly among young people who complain that uh, the reason they haven't been able to find jobs and that Europe hasn't done anything for them is because of this, um, of uh, their, their future being taken away from them by, by Madrid. But, the, uh, yeah, the regional separatist issue is going to uh, continue uh, to grow. Uh, and I think at one point, uh, Pige de Mont, the, the, the Catalan leader, was appealing to the European Union to come in as a sort of a, a mediator in this, uh, but the EU refused to do so, which I think was a mistake. It could have played a role because both sides are so stubbornly dug in right now um, and particularly uh, Mariana Rajoy, the Spanish Prime Minister, who comes from a very hard conservative wing that, uh, that will not tolerate any talk about a, a more autonomous Catalonia, uh, suggests that they need some kind of outside intervention. But right now, I don't see it happening. So we'll see what the outcome is. I think on December 28th, uh, 21st, the polls show that the independent, independistas will fall short, um, and uh, so the, uh, but there will still be a lot of continuing uh, uh, grievances, and it's going to be difficult to, to govern Spain, I think, um, particularly given the slim majority that, that Rajoy has. So this is also going to detract, distract Spain from playing an active role in the European Union. <clears throat> 
Susan Gittleson, you began your talk by mentioning the United States and the changed defense relationship with Europe. Uh, could you comment on NATO and what the impact of all this is having? Sure. Well, I think the uh, NATO has been very slow to respond to uh, both the new uh, security environment and and also the uh, the, the future challenge, uh, the political uh, phenomenon of the United States turning turning inward. Um, and I think the uh, clear sign of this, they just created a special task force on what to do about cyber warfare. Well, this has been going on for quite for a number of years now, particularly Russia uh, practice becoming a very avid and skilled practitioner of cyber warfare. For NATO to respond so slowly is 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 rather uh, disturbing. Um, but it's also it also shows that NATO fell asleep after. <clears throat> Uh, 1989, the, and the expansion when it seemed that, you know, Western democracy was triumphant, um, at, and the United States' is attention uh, to NATO uh, flagged as well because, it, as George H. W. Bush said, Europe is whole and free, and now Europe is fixed as a strategic problem. We can turn our attention elsewhere. So that's what's happened. That NATO has basically become complacent and now has only awakened to uh, the challenge of a, of a more aggressive Russia in just uh, the last couple of years. I don't see the, the, you know, the famous 2% rule that everybody is pushing for the European countries to live up to. OK, that will generate a little bit more defense spending. But just buying hardware is not going to be uh, a way to strengthen NATO. Um, when I was in Denmark, the ministry, Minister of Defense said, uh, you know, the Americans are pushing me to buy these F-35 super-duper fighter planes. Uh, if I buy four of them, that consumes 80% of my budget. So I think I could, uh, we in Denmark could contribute much more to Western defense by developing, we have, you know, a bright, skilled set of soldiers. We can develop special forces. <clears throat> that could operate in different areas of the world, that could be much more effective than us buying a couple of four uh, fighter planes uh, to supplement it. So this is the other thing, that, that you know, buying military hardware, even if you force the Germans to buy a couple more uh, aircraft carriers or something for several billion dollars, that doesn't necessarily strengthen European defense. So I think there has to be more emphasis on developing a coherent, effective strategy uh, in dealing with these new forces. And it's not just the threat from Russia. It's uh, what, we've just been, uh, what we've been talking about is uh, immigration issues. Because where has NATO been when all of these refugees were pouring in? I mean, this became a, a, a security threat to Europe that threatened to destabilize the whole continent, and yet uh, NATO said, oh, we don't have a role to play in all this. Well, they do, because this, is, this has become um, the, the fact that Europe did not secure its own, its periphery in establishing a borderless Europe um, opened the way for these refugees to come in. And so I think that NATO has to make itself relevant um, to the lives of people in Europe and show that it deserves to, uh, uh, to uh, continue to be in existence by dealing with these challenges. And the first place they could start would be having naval patrols um, and um, setting up a, uh, a policy that would, that would um, deal with the, the challenges of immigrants coming in. Uh, Don Simmons, a uh, question about Turkey. Erdogan becomes more authoritarian, uh, more and more Turks seem to be concluding that Europe was never seriously going to consider their admission to the EU. Uh, there is the friction with the United States in, involving the cleric and the Poconos. Um, the, the one bond I can think of between uh, Europe and Turkey is, seems to be the economic deal uh, which where the Europeans finance the 
uh, the, um, a large number of refugees who otherwise might come into uh, Europe. So my, my question is, do you see these uh, strains getting worse to the point where Turkey uh, withdraws from NATO? <clears throat> Well, I think, uh, yeah, it, it's certainly been heading in that direction. I mean, the, the Erdogan has developed a <clears throat> closer rapport with Vladimir Putin. Recently, he was at the summit in Moscow with uh, the Iranian leader, Rouhani, and Putin to decide what, how to uh, shape, uh, reshape Syria uh, after the, its civil war. And I think his... Uh, <clears throat> Putin's, I mean, uh, Erdogan's uh, hubris in, in thinking of himself as the new Ataturk who's going to reshape the Middle East on his own, if necessary, is something that is driving him away from not just the European Union, but also NATO. Now, the one saving grace could be uh, the, uh, you mentioned the economic uh, relationship. I think that's rather fragile because uh, if he gets angry, uh, he's capable of saying, uh, you know, okay, well, I'm going to tear up this economic agreement, open the floodgates, and send more uh, refugees into Europe. But I do think that there has been, <clears throat> at least in the past, a very strong um, uh, relationship between the military in the United States and in Turkey. Now, he has taken and made great efforts to... Um, um, Change the leadership in the military, and so that's probably had a bigger effect uh, um, in in weakening this relationship. But certainly, in the past, it's been one of the stronger anchors of keeping uh, one of the stronger factors in keeping Turkey anchored in the in in NATO. Uh, I'm not sure where that's that's going to go now, particularly because uh, Erdogan has seized uh, the levers of power in so many different ways, including the military. He's moving pe his own people into the leadership there. Um, so I think that is, that is also a risk in, in the reshaping of, of the greater Middle East that we see going on now. Uh, Richard Valcourt, <laughs> International Journal of Intelligence. Um, subtitle of your book, in part, is The Fate of the West. Some have seen policies that have been set down by Angela Merkel and others as suicide of the West. So we also have for many, many years comments of people in the foreign policy field saying nationalism is dead. Um, and now we call it populism that has arisen all over Europe. In that populism or nationalism, we've seen also the demand by certain countries in Eastern Europe to say, no, we do not want our cultures, our demographics, upset by a flood of refugees from countries that are not going to assimilate with us. And they've been criticized heavily for making those comments. And yet at the same time, they see what's happening in Western Europe. How do you reconcile that desire to be separate countries with their own cultures of historical importance, and then this tide of refugees that you, in fact, said so earlier, who come in and say nothing, and are creating a lot of problems in Western Europe? All right. Well, that goes to the heart of uh, <clears throat> of the issue that uh, facing Europe. I mean, we already see in Germany, Chancellor Merkel uh, moving to the right on the refugee issues, partly to mollify her uh, Christian uh, CSU part, uh, partners in, in Bavaria. But there is a, a realization uh, that in Germany that's going to be extremely difficult to integrate these people. I was there uh, when the first wave came in, in, in 2015, Germans were very proud of themselves, and Merkel had taken this bold and rather rash decision to allow everybody in, but in the Munich train station, people were there applauding, offering them food and clothing and shelter. But as time has gone on, two years later, the realization is that uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult to, to integrate them. Initially, they thought, oh, this will be easy because uh, these are well-educated Syrians, some of them had engineering backgrounds. All we have to do is teach them German. They'll be, well, it's turned out that their educational standards are much worse, lower than, than in the West. So it's been, this, this problem of integrating them 
has, been, uh, has become more acute. And uh, uh, Victor Urban in, in uh, Hungary, the prime minister there, is saying, I told you so. And I recount in my book one of the first, uh, it, it, Urban has been against allowing in uh, refugees from the start, and they had a there was a, a clash in the, one of the early meetings at the European Union summit in which Urban said, mark my words, uh, Chancellor Merkel, you will be, uh, I'm building a fence to keep these people out, and you will be forced to do the same thing in Germany. And she stared at him and said, uh, she said I grew up looking at a wall in my face, uh, and I'm determined I'm not going to have to live through that again. So um, Germany hasn't a, a step, built a wall, but um, it is uh, stepping up deportations of refugees. Uh, it's trying to integrate those that are there now and trying to keep them out. So I think that attitude is shared uh, in other places that took in a lot of refugees, such as Sweden. Uh, so there is a, a, a strong uh, agreement to curtail the number of refugees because they, they just can't cope with, with more of them. Um, and you mentioned the East. Uh, certainly in Poland and in Hungary, there's a reluctance to, to take no more, um, no, they haven't taken any refugees to begin with. But it's striking that in the areas, even in Germany, in Eastern Germany, where there aren't any many refugees, uh, the forces of populism are stronger than ever. So it's this fear mongering that has helped to fuel the populist uh, rise. I mean, I, I, I would hope uh, that uh, the, 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 the fuel that has, has driven the, the populist um, ascendancy it will, will start to diminish as uh, the, the centrist part, governing parties start to um, try to curtail the, the immigration flows and that there will be less public animosity about this. Ed Marshner, uh, I wonder if you share with us some of your uh, European interlocutors' views of the phenomenon, for, of the significance for them of the phenomenon we call Donald Trump. Well, I think um, I got a very good account um, uh, from Chancellor Merkel. Uh, one week after the election, um, so last November, uh, November 15th, uh, uh, President Obama um, made a farewell tour and visited Germany. <clears throat> and met with Merkel. They decided first they had a private dinner the first night, and it was it was such a an engaging. They decided to cancel their plans the next night. And had a second private dinner, and I got, I got a very good account of of what transpired. That basically she was saying, I can't work with this man, and she had not yet decided to run for another term. And uh, Obama said, You've got to run. You were the last person who can show leadership in the West and, and deal with him. And, um, and she said, no, I don't think I can do it. And finally, uh, because he stands for everything that I'm opposed to. And sure enough, uh, you know, Obama managed to persuade her. And five days later, she announced that she would run um, as the, the leader of the Christian Democrats for an unprecedented for a fourth term. Um, but I think after the first meetings, uh, she had a couple of meetings with uh, Trump and, and then the last one in Sicily. And it was then that she came back to Germany and said, you know, I think it's time for Europe to take its destiny in its own hand. And since then, there's been no contact with the White House. So it's clear that there is no uh, relationship there whatsoever, if anything. Macron has stepped into the breach, and he's tried to engage in with Trump in a dialogue uh, and because the French see a way now of increasing their profile as one of the few voices that can uh, that can that can deal with Trump uh, but it, it's curious the they I think they've absorbed this now and on my last trip to Europe at a number of places 
couple of conferences, it's almost as if America is treated as an afterthought. They're focused much more on where does Europe go from here? And I think there, we are entering a phase. I end the book. The epilogue is called A Post-American Europe, question mark. But I think we're moving in that direction, that the Europeans realize that 70 years of, of this close uh, rapport with the United States is a historic anomaly, and it's probably coming to an end, and that America has other uh, concerns that it's going to have to deal with. And a lot of uh, European voters are, uh, are not looking to the United States for, for any more leadership and uh, want to see it more, see, the, see Europe find its own way. Helen Finn, uh, Columbia University, and former colleague of, of Bill's in one of my previous lives. Um, Given, this is a big picture question, Bill, given the rise of China, anybody who watched the Congress meeting in China, the pomp and circumstance, the power, the unity, is it really a good thing to see these European institutions that we've secured for 70 years erode in the way you described what's going on with NATO? It's all well and good for Europeans to develop their own defense mechanisms, but should they not be coordinated with us? T you didn't even mention the TTIP, which somebody described recently as being put in the freezer. Uh, the European Union is getting weaker and weaker, the departure of the UK. Should we not be encouraging at uh, perhaps in a whole new way, but should we not be encouraging uh, greater and closer ties just to create a counterbalance in the world with the countries with which we have very strongly shared values. Right. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Helena, for that. No, I agree. I mean, I'm very much a, a, an Atlanticist at heart, and uh, I would like to see this, this relationship uh, sustained. But I'm, just, but I'm also a reporter who's looking at this uh, um, and, and, and trying to convey what I see uh, the forces on the ground and in what direction that they're they're moving and I have to say the um, that there there are very few trends that would seem to support a let's say a revival of of Atlanticism. Uh, you mentioned TTIP. I mean, it, partly it died because there's there's very little, if any, support in Europe for it. Uh, not just in, uh, the the Trump administration turning its back on it, um, and also it's a, I think there's a there's a deepening uh, sense of of the that Europe does not want to follow the lead of the United States anymore. This has been going on for some time. I think we saw initially back to the decision to go in to Iraq, uh, which was opposed by. Then Chancellor Schroeder of Germany and uh, President Chirac of France, and um, you know Schroeder told me he says you know Bush never apologized to me he he insulted me, but we turned out to be right and he was wrong, and uh, th there were, uh, there's a lot of that attitude. Why should we follow the United States into these misbegotten adventures in the Middle East and elsewhere? Uh, when we've got a lot of problems in, a, in our own backyard to deal with. And, and by the same, in the Midwest, when I was traveling around, dinner I had with Governor Kasich, you know, I, ha I heard a lot of thoughtful people saying, you know, I like Europe, uh, but why should we still be protecting them 70 years on when they are wealthy enough to deal with them, when we have so many other problems at home? And I just see that the, the ties have, have become much looser. Uh, you may recall when you were serving in the Foreign Service, uh, we had something like 375,000 troops in Germany. Uh, well, a lot of these troops uh, would come back to the United States, Montana, Alabama, wherever they'd be, and they would always say, you know, the two years I spent in Kaiserslautern were the two best years of my life, and so they had these strong memories, and they became forces in their community uh, 
to help elect members of Congress who had an abiding support for uh, the transatlantic relationship. Uh, and that's all gone now. I mean, the, the, the American forces in Europe are down to about 30,000. And uh, so you don't have a strong base of support of Americans who have experience in Europe. And I think that is a big factor um, in, in the weakening of, of the, the fiber that, that, that holds its, us together. And you mentioned the, it, the Chinese are moving in in a big way. I mean, that's the other striking thing. I'm, my next book is going to deal with how Europe uh, finds its own way. And one of the big sections of it will be the remarkably fast uh, rise of China as a, as a force. I mean, they have, with the One Belt, One Road initiative, they now bought up the, the port of Piraeus outside Athens. They're building a high-speed railroad right into the heart of Europe so that they can ship their goods <clears throat> straight across Asia to Greece and then right into uh, Central Europe. They're buying up a lot of small companies that are engineering marvels in, in Germany. It's so much so that the German state is getting alarmed about the hollowing out of their, their industry. Um, and this is going to continue. So it's, it's a new challenge um, that America faces. And if we turn our back on our European friends um, and treat them as commercial rivals rather than as allies, then this is only going to accelerate. Thank you. I'm Christian Mehta. You've outlined 2017 as being a very tumultuous year uh, for Europe and, of course, the years preceding them, too. What can we look, what are some indicators that we can look towards 2018 and 2019 that will give us an idea as to whether the fractured Europe, as you've outlined, will come together or will further disintegrate? Are there more referendums, elections, events that might happen? For example, China has committed to the rebuilding of Syria. I wonder what but that might have an impact. Mm -hmm. The German Marshall Fund in reverse in African countries might be a force of stability. So what are some indicators we can look to in 2018 and beyond that will give us a bit clues to where things are headed? Right. Uh, well, I, I, I did mention, you know, I think 2018 will be a, a very critical year, <clears throat> a hinge moment in history, you know, and perhaps. Uh, and we will see... Um, I think uh, a further estrangement in relations between the United States and Europe. Um, but where Europe, uh, how Europe decides on whether it wants to move forward with uh, more efforts to integrate and, and let's say solidify the Eurozone, uh, I think that's going to be difficult because Germany has a lot of second, second thoughts about that. And also in Eastern Europe, they fear the creation of a multi-tier Europe, that there would be a Europe of, of different speeds and they would be left behind. So you're gonna have competing forces within Europe which may lead to further paralysis because um, a number of countries are saying, no, we can't give more central authority to Brussels. We need to uh, retain our own sovereignty and pull back uh, power uh, to the national capitals. Uh, so I think that this is, uh, we're going to see, it's going to be much more difficult for Macron and Merkel <clears throat> to push ahead with a plan to uh, revive Europe in the, over the course of the next year. And uh, I think a lot of people are saying, you know, let's pray for a miracle in Britain that the Brits come to their senses and uh, maybe move ahead with a second referendum. If that should happen and Britain should, should uh, show its remorse by deciding to stay in the, in the European Union, that would have a huge uh, positive boost for confidence. Um, and it's not just for the European Union, it's also for, for NATO, because if Britain pulls out of the EU, it's also going to raise questions about how committed are they as Europe's greatest defense power to the protection of the European continent. And I think that... Uh, you know, this would be this would be the most positive development. But if it if it goes as things are now, and they proceed to along the path to pulling out of the EU, and the EU stays uh, divided, then I think we're going to see more and more um, 
political extremism uh, on the right, on the far right, but even more worrisome is the, the social unrest and uh, concern among young people in places, particularly in, in southern Europe, where you get a sense that um, people under young people have been unable to find sustainable jobs for since the financial crisis in 2008. Now you, there's talk about a lost generation of, uh, of young people who are now turning 40, no jobs, they can't start a family, and that is becoming a real social crisis uh, for much of Europe. I thank you for a very sobering but excellent tour of Europe. And I want to remind you that his book is available. That was excellent. Great. They could have kept you much longer. Okay. But you'll come back. Yes, absolutely.